which one is the presentation for this? I see three potentially for the registry. Is this one? This one? Or this one? No. Ah, so it's this one. What is this? Copy of presentation. Uh, they changed the name. Okay, I use this because. Which this one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just another one. Um, it's time to get started, everybody. Good morning, I'm Robin Smith from the Joint Research Centre, and we're going to try and tell you some of the tools we've been developing as central components for the implementation of INSPIRE. Uh, most of the presentations are from colleagues from our unit, which is now called Digital Economy. Um, we should maybe have a time for a couple of questions after uh, each presentation, but there should also be a little bit of time at the end for some discussion. So without further ado, I invite Vlado to come and talk about the uh, INSPIRE knowledge base, which is our new website. Thank you, Robin. Good morning, everybody. Okay. Let's start. Okay. Uh, as I said, thank you, Robin. Uh, I'm also coming from the GRC, and it's my pleasure <coughs> today, this morning, to present you a new web page, which we are calling now Inspire Knowledge Base. Uh, you will see why. Uh, I hope uh, that you already play a little bit or visit it a little bit because we released it uh, last week, Thursday, I think. So it's already online and uh, I hope you will find more and more uh, information and more user-friendly way to investigate Inspire. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Uh, why a new uh, web page or what, what, what was the idea behind? Uh, let's say that uh, you probably noticed uh, many, many times in the past that there are many platforms uh, around the Inspire, not only the Inspire web page as itself, but also many, many other platforms. First of all, Inspire Geoportal, but then Registry, uh, thematic platforms, uh, find your scope, and so on and so on. So many, many different platforms. And so sometimes was really, really difficult to understand where to go, where to find the right information. Even for me, who I'm actually using it for many, many years since my PhD uh, back in 2007, and sometimes was really difficult to find the proper information. So the idea really uh, was to, 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 to see how, how, how we can integrate this, this different platform and how we can help users, especially in the now, in this moment when uh, we have many, many tasks to do, uh, especially with the harmonization of special data, how really to help users to find proper information and to, to go uh, through. Uh, yeah, so we all know Inspire is a process, and uh, right now we are really in the implementation phase regarding the data uh, and harmonization of the data. Uh, the idea, as I said, was to connect all of these uh, disconnected components and to help help users to find their their way to through the through the Inspire. Also, there is a need to add uh, some new tools, guidance uh, to support, to have some sustainable solution, as it is written here, uh, to rationalize uh, resources, but uh, also the opportunity to add value uh, by using resources across the components. Uh, the fact is also that uh, not only in the, from the point of the European Commission, but there are also uh, other sources of, of information, uh, in, uh, especially in the member states, uh, different projects, and, and, and the idea was really to try to connect all, all, all of these uh, disconnected uh, resources. Uh, this slide maybe some of you remember from the uh, last year INSPIRE conference. Uh, that was actually explanation what was this idea behind how, how, how to integrate uh, all of, all of these uh, different uh, sources uh, of information. Uh, the major idea uh, was actually to, 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 to try to integrate the, 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 the different information 
in, uh, in several areas. And you can see the major areas here on this slide. So we tried to, to, to uh, combine or, or to integrate sources of information into the five uh, main areas, which you will find on the new, new Inspire knowledge base. First is to learn, then implement, use, participate, and tools. So in the next slides, I, I will just go very quickly through. Mm, actually, offline, I will not uh, use, use interactively because it's up to you to, to, to go and to visit the web page and, and, and then, of course, to, to, to give us uh, the feedback. Um, what is improved? I would say that uh, for sure uh, better, it's uh, much more better to navigate, to find the, the information through the, through the uh, knowledge base. Then it's also possible, uh, which is still ongoing work actually uh, with this uh, uh, ECAS uh, login, uh, which actually will change, in, I think, in the f uh, f future because they, they now I think it will be EU login or something like that. They announced a new new way. And uh, we try really to build, let's say, a common gateway, gateway to, to all Inspire platforms. Okay, so this is the uh, main, uh, main page of uh, Inspire Knowledge Base. Uh, it looks quite different than, than the old uh, uh, web page. And as I said, uh, we have these main, uh, five main areas here, which I already noticed. So learn, implement, participate, use, and then actually toolkit. So the, 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 the link to different uh, tools uh, uh, which help you in the, in the, in the Inspire implementation. Uh, this is the top menu. Then below you will find the quick, let's say, links to uh, main, let's say, tools uh, uh, in the Inspire. So we have here a library. Then uh, you go further for, for the other uh, sources of the information. And then on the below you also have a quick links to uh, different, uh, different parts, different areas uh, in Inspire. And you will find also here a link to the old web page. So the old web page is not uh, closed, let's say. It's, uh, we will use it as an archive, so it will stay as it is. Uh, so whenever you want, also for the people who were familiar with the, with the old web page of, of Inspire, they can quickly find it and, and use it as they were used it before. But however, I strongly recommend to use the new web page because it's much, much more easier and much more user-friendly to find all the information which you are looking for. Okay, very quickly uh, go to different menus. Uh, learn, actually we try to integrate all, all different uh, sources, uh, let's say, to learn about uh, the Inspire. So. Probably you remember this about Inspire or who is who in Inspire. It was also the content of, of the old web page. Uh, here we put uh, again about Inspire, uh, policy background, principles, legislation, and so on and so on. But also training, I think this is a very, very important uh, 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 source for the people to, to, to really learn about the Inspire. Um, and especially these days, I had many, many discussion with the people who are for the first time on the Inspire conference and who really needs to, to, to get the knowledge uh, about Inspire. And uh, this is something uh, we will try to integrate a learning platform also coming from the LinkFit project, so online le uh, learning platform, also together with the trainings which we are providing on the GRC and uh, EC level. Uh, next one. Uh, is uh, implementation. Uh, if you go here, also again, we try to integrate all sources uh, regarding to uh, implementation of the of the Inspire. Again, I will not really go through now, so it's up to you to to, to go online and 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 to play with all of these uh, sources. What we try to do, for example, when you go to implementation and then you uh, choose, let's say, one of the Inspire data teams, I, here I uh, go for the cadastral parcels. We try really to integrate all uh, possible sources where you, where you can find information, for example, on one particular team which you are looking for. So when you go for, for example, here for cadastral parcels or, or any other teams, so you can go to different other sources, to the thematic clusters, to find your scope. Uh, so we try to link 
all, all sources which is available for a particular theme or particular topic uh, which you are uh, searching for. So I hope it, it is really, really much more better than before because before it was really a bit disintegrated and it was not easy uh, to find uh, what you are actually looking, looking for sometimes. Um, then participate again uh, here. It's all about the participation, about the stakeholders, users, and so on and so on. Uh, here you will find also the maintenance and implementation framework and MIG. Uh, so again, we wanted to integrate uh, in, in, in one topic for all stakeholders to easily find uh, what is all about, also pool of experts, and so on and so on. Uh, then <clears throat> use, uh, which is, uh, of course, uh, always important topic. As we heard yesterday, many, many times, uh, also on the plenary, who is the user of, of Inspire and so on. So here, the, the idea is really to provide uh, information for the users of, of Inspire. Especially, we are trying to uh, also build many use cases which are already uh, available to show really for the users how they can use, uh, how they can use uh, uh, Inspire and where to find, and so on and so on, Inspire data. So I think it's, it's very valuable. Uh, toolkits, many, many different toolkits already available. Uh, also, um, Inspire in practice or previous arena is here. So again, I will not go through. It's up to you to go there and, and to play and to invest some time and, and, and to uh, see what is what is all behind so we try really to integrate every every available uh, tools right now uh, of course it's a living platform so living uh, web page living knowledge base so for sure there will be some new new ads uh, in, in, in in the future times uh, but as I said I, I really recommend you to go and and to see how how it looks like I hope you will all like it uh, what is um, also added is this uh, quick search, which you can see here. Uh, so we tried, um, we were trying to see what was the most important for the users. Then we put some tags and trying to, to, to do some uh, quick search menu, which also can help you to uh, find information uh, better and, and, and faster uh, than, than uh, before. Yeah, we expect your feedback because as I said, it's a work ongoing. So um, on, the, on the, this uh, below uh, menu, on the, on, on the web page, you can find the uh, feedback uh, link. So we expect that you will give us uh, your feedback so that we can even more uh, improve uh, what we already did. And I hope you will all enjoy in, in, in this new Inspire knowledge base. Uh, as I said, the, all web page is not closed, it's still living, but uh, as an archive. So you can, you can, you can find it uh, also, uh, the link from the new web page, from the new knowledge base, but also this is a direct link to this archive. So for all of you who were familiar maybe more with the, with the old one, you c there is still on uh, and, and you can use it. However, it will go in the parallel uh, and it will stay uh, at this, but I, I am sure and I believe you will all uh, become uh, users of a new Inspire knowledge base. Thank you very much for your attention. There's time for a couple of questions if anybody has one. I'll see if I can get a roving microphone. I think probably, yeah. Just one second for the microphone. Yeah. Oh. Hello. Um, and we must uh, have a login to these pages. Or, or not. As, I, as I said, it's a work uh, ongoing. So we, we, we will try to integrate this ECAS login. 
So for the time being, there is no uh, login, if you noticed, if you go to the web page. But uh, we are integrating it. Uh, we have some issues uh, on the security level and so on. But I think very soon you will, you will see possibility to log in into the web page. And it will be... It's not necessary. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not necessary. Okay. So if you... If, yeah, everything is open, open but uh, okay. if you log in, then you will have some more, let's say, uh, information and more possibilities uh, uh, on the web page. It will be announced. And adding information, yeah, as Robin said. Any other questions? Is there one here? Hi, Ilkar from Spatino. Um, I'm sure you are taking care of this, but I hope the redirections from the old uh, addresses work uh, <laughs> because those, there are thousands and thousands of links to the old clumsy URLs around the world, so please make that work. Yeah, yeah. Th th thank you for this. I already heard yesterday from several people that there are li some links which are not, <laughs> not working, so we will, of course, try to solve it very, very fast and soon. Thank you. Uh, maybe just a, a comment on that. It, this is brand new, as, as Vlado said. Um, there, there are bound to be bugs and things that don't work properly. So please, please have a look and send us feedback. If you find anything that doesn't work, if you, th if you have troubles finding things, if you, if, you think, if you have ideas on how to improve this, please give us feedback so that we can improve the site. So let's move on. We're on time. I like that. I invite Michael to the stage uh, to talk about the GeoPortal. Is this one? Over to you, Michael. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. Uh, my name is Michael Lutz. Also, I work at the Joint Research Center in the same unit as, as the other gentleman here. Um, I, I had the, the disputable honor to, to, to uh, present to you the, the Inspire Geo Portal, and I really, really wish I could present to you, like Vlado did, uh, a new page that we've just launched. Um, but unfortunately, um, I still have to, to show you a preview of what's going to go uh, live um, later this year or early next year. So to give you a bit of history on, on where we are with the, with the Geo Portal and what happened over the last... Uh, five years or so. Um, as many of you know, we have two uh, GeoPortal uh, versions. Uh, one is what we call the JRC pilot version, which is the one that is running uh, currently on the Inspire website and is also linked from the Inspire website. And the other one is um, the real GeoPortal that we procured um, uh, under a contract. So the whole work basically uh, on this started in, in 2011. Um, where we started, um, well, we already had done development uh, in JRC um, on the GeoPortal, and we basically decided to um, f freeze the development on the, the front end, uh, sort of the user interface, um, because we were at the same time starting um, with the procurement version that, that should take over um, from the, the pilot version at JRC. Um, so basically, the, in 2011, we, we started the, the procurement procedure and, and launched the first uh, contract um, for the procurement version uh, with the uh, consortium um, consisting of uh, Planetech and, and Lat Long. Um, and uh, the, the, the scope of that contract was to, to develop the, the basic architecture, the back end and the front end, um, and it should be based on, on discovery and view. Because at that time, these were the only two services for which there were technical specifications available, and these were the only ones that were mandatory for member states um, to be had. Um, now, in 2012, we, we basically um, worked further on the JRC pilot version. Um, we extended the, the back-end services, and we implemented some workarounds um, together with, or in, in discussion with member states for, for imperfect uh, metadata. Um, and we also integrated uh, the access to download uh, services, which were uh, starting to be become online, and there was the technical specification available. 
Um, and at the same time, the, the development and testing of the procurement version was, was going on. Then in 2013, um, there was some further uh, development on the procurement version. We, we started to, to put in a, a discovery um, endpoint register. So we basically started to um, work stronger with member states and to try and get a more, um, let's say, organized uh, discussion going with the representatives in the member states that are responsible for the national discovery service endpoints. And I think I, we could say that this was the start of the activity that we're still doing today uh, on running a help desk uh, for the geoportal and for the connection of the national services um, with, the, with the central uh, Inspire geoportal. Um, we also started some development work on the uh, metadata editor to help people to, to create metadata um, themselves. Um, and we um, started um, to do some uh, initial work on the validation tool to, to see how, how well the, the, actually the metadata performed and where there were still errors to be fixed in the national discovery services. Um, on the procurement version, we, we basically had the first version of the, of the Planetic Galatlong portal delivered, but because of a number of delays, both on our end with the procurement um, and um, also during the contract, we basically um, had a version there that did not include uh, the download service um, that was not included in the initial contract. Um, and um, that basically led to the decision at the time that we would not uh, go live with this um, <clears throat> with this uh, first version because it would uh, there's a, there was a legal ob obligation on the commission to operate uh, this portal to that member states could connect their services to and if that portal didn't have uh, the possibility to have uh, download services connected that would create a problem now in 2014 um, we we continued to evolve the the back end at the at the JSC services we, we there was an evolution a version two of the, the validator that basically led to the validation tool that we have uh, on the uh, inspire G portal site uh, today um, and we we drafted a follow-up contract um, for a version two of the procurement version that should include the uh, download service um, and um, do some optimizations uh, around performance and usability. Um, again, in 2015, some improvements here. We had, uh, sorry, a browser developed um, that people could use to more intuitively browse through the um, errors and issues in their, uh, in their metadata. And I think it's, it's quite a powerful tool for those of you who have not seen it yet. I suggest that you, you try it out. It's, it's really useful if you're trying to find out um, what kind of issues and what kind of um, metadata of different types there are in the geoportal. And as, as I said, we, we started really going Mm, full speed, I would say, with the, with the help desk activity. I think this is one of the tasks that takes uh, up a lot of time um, of our colleague uh, Angelo Qualia, that many of you may, may know, um, to actually help um, contact points in the member states to, with issues uh, related to their discovery services and the connection to the geoportal. Um, the the, the Planetic uh, Latlong contract uh, finished in 2016. Um, we have the version 2 developed, uh, de delivered um, earlier this year, spring this year, um, and, and that's where we, we are basically uh, now. So you, you can see from this little timeline that we, we kind of had a, a kind of a race between uh, struggling with the administrative procedures uh, of procurements uh, in the commission that um, many of you working in public authorities may be familiar with or can probably understand. Um, and, and the development work that we had to do uh, on, the, uh, on the pilot version of the, of the uh, geoportal. And, and I'm sorry to say that we, it, it seems that we've lost that race in, in a way that we, we didn't manage to actually put out the, the procurement version um, in time. So that's where we are. Uh, we have these two versions and we, the, um, the basically the, the two uh, portals are quite different from what you've, you've seen so far as well. The JRC version has basically strongly focused on the, on the back end, uh, on the harvesting, on the validator, on the reporting tools and the interactions with member states. Whereas the, the procurement version basically has, has focused, has strong points on the user uh, um, usability side, on the user interface, 
Uh, it has quite um, sophisticated search uh, capabilities, uh, much better language support, um, and, and better possibilities to, to customize. So what we're, what we're doing at this moment, and, and hopefully until the end of this year, um, we'll complete that uh, work, is to, to merge the best of, of both worlds into a, a common um, version that should be go going online. Um, so we're in, in this phase now uh, basically training the operational team um, to, um, to run the, to take over the Planet Tech portal and run it internally. We're doing some testing, we're doing integration um, with the, with the back end um, that we have with, uh, in the, developed in the JRC. And, and basically we're, we're getting familiar with the code in order to, to basically do any, any further updates that are necessary. Um, there are also a number of features that need to be added uh, that were not in the uh, initial contracts. One is related to, to ACAS. Um, uh, another one is related to the fact that we want to actually publish uh, this software as open source and we, we need to kind of package that in order to, to publish it according to the, the commission rules that we have for that. Um, next, so I said early next year we want to then finally deploy this, this new uh, GeoPortal uh, online in an operational uh, environment and work on uh, some further uh, streamlining of the, the performance and, and the user interaction. Um, we also want to, to, of course, continue our activities related to the help desk. Um, and um, the idea is, and we're going to hear about the validation uh, service later from Clemens um, and Robin, um, to also uh, link in with the, the new validator that, that is being developed um, under the ARENA project as well. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's it from the Outlook point of view. So just to give you a, a, a short sneak preview of, of what it's going to look like, uh, or what it, it does look like in the, in the current version, is we, we have this basic um, front end where you basically have a number of features to select your language. And one of the nice features is that basically it, it reads all the metadata in in the original language and then does an on-the-fly translation uh, of the, the results. So you don't have to manually go and translate it into your chosen language, but it does that in the background and re refreshes basically does the on-the-fly on the translation. Um, so on, on the home page, you basically start with the Inspire themes. So this, for us, we thought is, is one of the main starting points that you could have. You have a short introduction um, to the themes coming from the Inspire registry. Um, and you also have a number of uh, quick indications on, on the map on how many hits you have <clears throat> on the selected um, theme um, per country. So that's a very, let's say, simple uh, introduction. Then we have a, a more, um, let's say, thorough way of browsing through the, the content. Um, you have a hierarchy on the left-hand side where that consists first of the theme as the first level, and then per country, and then data and service type. So this is basically the hierarchy that you can use to browse through. And depending on what you select uh, on the left, you will basically get the, the filtered result lists uh, with the number of icons on the country, on the type of service um, that you, you find for that, um, for that selection. Um, then, the, let's say, the more um, advanced search is the, is the search area, the discovery area, where you can um, define a bounding box. You can define your search terms either as, as free text search or you have some more refined filters on the different uh, attributes in, in the metadata. Um, and um, you get the, the search results. As I said, these are uh, translated on the fly, so when you do a search, the first you get is the national language, and you see then um, quickly the the, um, the user interface is refreshing and is, is actually translating all the results into your chosen language. So what you see is basically, it's, I would say it's a, a classical uh, geo portal, but it, it has these kind of uh, nice features uh, of the language, and, and hopefully we think uh, a nice user interface with the, the different icons and the possibilities to navigate through. Um, one of the interesting, well, I think most interesting features, um, I would think, is the, the basket idea. So um, you have a kind of a shopping basket that you can uh, store your, um, your search results in and, and you, can, you can put them there for further use. So if you want to do a number of different searches and you, you found something interesting in your first search, you put it in the basket and then you continue your search and you can keep adding things to the basket. 
Um, obviously, you can also download the data sets. And um, the, the last feature that we have is basically to visualize some of your results um, that you have collected in your basket um, as, as map layers. So you have your basket available and you can use them to add them to a map to get an overview of the things that you've selected. So that's basically a quick overview about the functionalities of the portal. We will also do demos of the current version. Again, I said it's not yet live for anybody to try, but if you come to the stand today or tomorrow in the lunch break, um, our colleagues will be there uh, to demo um, the version um, that we're currently working on in, on the internal service. Um, the the further features that we, we haven't shown so far is that we can communicate with external validators. As I mentioned before, we're planning to, um, to point to the new validator that's currently being developed. Um, we are integrating it, as I said, with the current Harvester module, so that basically the backend that we've developed in the JRC will be used as the, the harvesting um, module um, for the, the software. Um, and you can, once you've logged in, you can also store your searches and, and maps in your user profile. So I think that is uh, one of the also useful functionalities if you use the, the portal more often. You can come back to your searches and, and see what you found um, and show it to, to other people if necessary. So that was a very quick overview. As I said, um, there will be demos today and tomorrow or on request if you want. Angelo just came in. <laughs> we'll be doing the, the, the demos um, at the Inspire stand. And um, please come and pass by and, and have a look. And happy for any questions. Thank you. Time for one quick question. Questions? Okay. Oh, Christine, if we could have the microphone here, please. Well, maybe I can just one. How is the translation done? Is it uh, it's based on Microsoft Translator, so it's running in the background. Any other quick questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Next up, it will be Robert. tell you about find your scope. Thanks, Robert. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Also from my side, my name is Robert Thomas, and I also work for the Digital Economy Unit, the Inspired GRC team. And it's my pleasure today to present to you a tool that we call the Find Your Scope, which is a part of the bigger set of tools that we call the interactive data specifications. First of all, um, I would like to see hands from you who has tried already the Find Your Scope tool, who has heard something about it. Perfect. So, exactly. <laughs> so I can save maybe the time. So, okay, so for those who hasn't shown their hands, I will, I will give you a short overview of the tool. As uh, also Michael said before, and, and Robin will say the same, so there is an Inspire booth where we are running the demos, and we have people there that, you know, if you are interested in more detailed functionality of the tools, you know, you can always pop in there and you can, you can ask and you will be explained, you will, they will explain to you the things. So, basically, why we, why we have developed such a tool? So, we all know that we have created a, quite an extensive uh, set of technical and legal rules. Some people say Inspire is complex. Inspire is difficult to, to, to learn, to start with, and so on and so forth. So we ha do have to admit that it's, it is difficult, especially for newcomers, and it's uh, very often the language that we use is for experts. So, we, we are aware of this and therefore since 2013 we have been developing a lot of tools to basically simplify and to make it more accessible for you. So the Inspire Interactive Data Specification Toolkit <clears throat> is an in-house development set of applications that as I said are for you to make the technical and legal documentation more accessible and more useful. Who are the target 
user. So this tool specifically is targeted for the data providers. That's the main target group that we have been thinking about because they are actually um, facing the issue of implementing Inspire. So therefore, you know, that, that was the major target group. But also the, 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 the tools are useful for newcomers to very quickly get the, the understanding about the data scoping of, of Inspire. So what, what, what can I expect? Actually, what is Inspire about in terms of data? What, ob what object types are defined there, et cetera, et cetera. Also for the policy makers where, especially now that we are running this better regulation and refitting and re-evaluating the original ideas of Inspire and putting Inspire in, in other domains. So those policy <coughs> uh, people can quickly see where Inspire might be, might be useful. Where are, the, where are the overlaps? Where are the, 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 the things that Inspire can bring to those communities? And as well as for the so, so solution and service providers, they are also can take the advantage of, of these tools. So, so there are two applications in the, in the pack. One is called Find Your Scope, which is the, let's say the major one. And then there is a, something that we call the data specification or interactive data specification on technical guidelines. And this is basically an online application that is uh, giving you the possibility to quickly go to the specific section in, in, in the documents. But I will show you later how it works. Where can you find the access to this? So we presented today your, the new website. So if you look at the new website, you will quickly find that on the, on the landing page, there is, a, there is an icon, it's called Find Your Scope. So this is the entrance. So there are other entrances, there are other ways how you can enter it, but probably this one is the easiest. Also down the bottom you can see another way how you access the, the interactive data specification um, landing page. So once you are there, you will see quickly the two applications. So find your scope and the technical guidelines. So here you, you choose what you want. So do you want to find, do you want to find what, um, what your data needs to be translated or transformed into in, in terms of Inspire or not? Or you would like to study bits of, bits of technical documentation. So based on this, this decision, you, will, you, will select your, you should select your application. So if you are now in the find your scope, which is here really to help with your data transformation, you have three options, how you evaluate what is the scope of your database towards the Inspire uh, requirements, data requirements. And we developed three options how you can define, how you can define which Inspire objects you have to take into account that are relevant for your data that you then have to trans transform if you want to be compliant or if you want to make your data interoperable according to Inspire. Yeah. Okay, so now I will, I will show you the, the, let's say one of the options, which is the interactive workflow, which is a workflow that, that leads you through set of, set, set of steps towards the final selection set of Inspire objects. So you start with the selecting the Inspire team, then, because some of the teams, they have several application schema, so you are asked to select the application schema. You can always select more, because one of the big option, one of the big advantage of this application is th that it reflects the reality that the data providers, they don't have data organized according to Inspire teams. Very often, their data sets are going across the Inspire teams. So you really need to, to, to know where to go to pick up your objects from different Inspire teams in order to address the data scope of your data set. Okay, so that's why you are able here to select more than one teams, you are able to select more than one application schema. So once you select your application schema or schemas, then you will get the list of all the objects that are defined for this application schema, including the, well, sorry, it's not really readable, but you know, you can, you can see that there is a list of spatial object types with the definitions um, uh, organized according to whether it's an abstract spatial object, it's, it's the real one, etc., etc. So 
And again, you, you, you have the option now to select which objects are related to your data set. So what, what is the content? So you do your evaluation, you know, you, you know what you have and you are comparing with the definition that Inspire requires. So once you, once you select an object or set of objects, you also see the, all the attributes. So all the property of the object types that are defined, you see the, the attributes here, you, you see the definition of the attributes, and again, you, you select, if you, for instance, select one attribute, which is a code list in this case, then you see the values of all the code lists in various forms. So there are two, op two, two options for you to visualize the, 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 op the, the code list. So you have the list of values with definitions. You have the graphical, graphical mm, option to see the hierarchies, for instance, because several of the code lists are hierarchical. And again, immediately if you click on it, you see the definitions of it. So, you have really all what you need to judge whether that object is really the one that you need for your transformation. So, you know, and then you can go back and forth. So it's an interaction here between the data provider and what is defined by Inspire. So at the end, you're basically creating a your selection set. So you can see it as a, as a favorites or the basket as Michael said in turn. And so, and it looks like this. So this is the final selection of your objects. Um, and what to do now? So here down, you see the options that we created for you, what to do with this selection object. So you can, you can print a structured report where you will see all the properties of those objects. What is the benefit here is that you don't see only the objects that you selected, but all mandatory links and mandatory objects that are associated to it. So for those, and there are, there's a majority who doesn't understand UML, it's very difficult now to read it, the Inspire technical documentation without the UML knowledge. So here the tool is helping you not to, that you don't need to know the knowledge because it's taken care, it's, it's, it's embedded inside. So you select a borehole, but the borehole is associated with other objects. And if the association is mandatory, then also that object you have to provide the information about or you have to transform to. So, so this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the way how we try to help people without the real UML knowledge. Another option for the outcome is the matching tables. So matching tables are Excel spreadsheets that are structured that you can then use with your data set really to put your attributes, your information, and try to find the mapping between the Inspire definition, inspire attributes, and your data set and your attributes. So it's predefined for you. So it's an Excel spreadsheet. On one side, you have inspire objects as you select it. And on the, on the right side, it's empty. It's ready for your input. Another output is hail transformation. So your selection set can become, within one click, a target schema into the hail transformation. OK, so what do you select here? You just click the button and you go to the, to the hail where this target schema is, is populated. And then you do the transformation of your data set towards this target schema, which is in the hail, okay? So I think it's, it, it's, very, it, it's very powerful in a way. And last, last thing that we created recently for you is the executive report, what, as we call it, and this is, this is the, the target group is the manager, are the managers who are, who has to decide about resources. So let's say you are a GIS department um, um, head and um, you know that there is an effort needed to transform your data sets into, into Inspire. And you have to convince your manager, you know, to say, okay, I need resources. So here we develop a little tool that if you provide the effort needed for the transformation of the, of the objects that you selected before, we generate a report for your manager summarizing the, summarizing the effort and the level of alignment needed, okay? So it's a little tool that we just developed because we thought it might be useful. So of course that your feedback will, will tell us whether it's useful or not. Okay, so that was the interactive workflow. As I said, there are three options how you 
how you go to the final selection set of Inspire objects. Another, object, another option is the catalog of Inspire objects. So it's a basic feature catalog where we ordered all the spatial object types defined by Inspire by alphabetical order. So again, you can very quickly go, if you know, you can very quickly go to your objects and then the procedure is the same. So are, you are selecting your objects and you're creating the final set of objects that then you have to transform into. The last option is the direct search. Here, you don't go through selection anything, you just put your text. You, you, you for instance, you are, a, you are administrating the register of landslides. So you, you don't know whether you belong to Inspire. You are not from this community, fine, you just put the landslide and this direct search will tell you, will give you the results of the search in terms of the, the object types that are present, the application schemas where landslides are, and, 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 and code lists and values that are, that are featuring the, the landslide text. On the right side, which I'm sorry you don't see, we put a kind of a legend, because this search goes through the definition, descriptions, the labels, of the spatial object types, values, application schema. So all the items of the, of the content is being searched here and it gives you the list of objects or application schema, etc., with the relevance. So the relevance is the legend that should give you a, an, a hint whether the landslide, if is there an object that object type defined. Okay, so I think this uh, relevance legend is, is, is quite interesting to, for you to, to have a look. Okay, so that was about find your scope. So the, the main idea is really you are interacting with Inspire in this way to find which objects from, from, di sorry, from different uh, teams are relevant for your data set. The second application is, a, is, a sim is, a, is an application that simplifies the, the studying, the, the reading of the technical documentation. You just select, you select your team again. You can select up to two. So for instance here I select geology and land use. And then you get the HTML page where you can on the left side, you see the, 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 the chapters from the data specification document, and you can directly go to each of the chapter and you can compare. So what is this good for, apart from quick access to the latest version of the technical guidelines, is that you can, for instance, compare very quickly the use cases that were, that were developed during the, the process of development of the data specification. So if you are interested why, why the data, why the model is uh, covering this and that, you can go directly to the chapter about use cases to see you know, the, the reasoning, or hopefully you will see the reasoning there. Okay, so these are the, the final slides. Uh, what, what are the data sources for this application? So the major data source is the consolidated UML Inspire data repository, so the enterprise architect files. That's for the find your scope. Then we are directly interlinked with the registry, so we are using the code list register, the enumeration register, the application schema registers, the team register, so the, there is an integration inside with the registries from regist Inspire uh, Registry. <laughs> and of course, we are using the, the final versions of the technical documentation data specification. So just to summarize once again, so this set of tools is to simplify the use. That's the main purpose. It is for the data providers mainly, but also for the newcomers to understand whether their data sets belong to Inspire and exactly in what sense, which, which parts, which objects needs to be transformed. It also gives you the direct input to the transformation. So we are helping you also partly with that aspect. So we have been using Hale and so we are promoting the, the, this transformation tool here. You can finally, you can very quickly find the Inspire data scope by using the feature catalog for instance or direct searching. So you will quickly see what is regulated and what is the property in Inspire. And we hope it also facilitate the interoperability, which, is, which I think is, is, is clear here. Okay, so, and at the end you see the, the, sets, of, the sets of output that you can get from, 
from using using this tool. Okay, that's that's all for me. Thank you very much. Time for a quick question again, if anybody has one. All clear, of course, as Robert mentioned, there's uh, the opportunity to talk to and Manuela and uh, the others involved in developing this at the booth. Okay, now I'll ask uh, Daniele to come up, please. Good morning, everybody. I'm Daniele Francioli, working for the same unit as a member of the JRC registry team. I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, reference code, how to manage reference code, and uh, of course about the registry software. Um, I am a member of the JRC registry team, together with Emanuela, Lorena, and of course Michael. Okay. We can start from a very simple question. Why do we need reference code? So here you can see, you can see <coughs> a pan-European context or cross-border cross context where different stakeholder, stakeholders have to, to share data. And here they are using free text, as you can see. So it's clear that it's difficult to understand uh, for the same field the, the data that are provided. But even in uh, the um, different language, because we are talking about different language here, but even if we have the, the same language, it could be represented in different ways. In the next slide, I'm going to show you the same scenario, but with uh, the use of the reference code. Reference code. Okay, here we go. And it's clear that it's more simple using the reference code to, to provide the same data. Okay, but what about managing reference code? Here there are two concepts. One is the registry, that is uh, the information system on which the reference code are maintained. So it's a software. Then we have the register, that is a set of files containing identifiers assigned to the, the item contained in the register. And uh, the main operation related to the management of a reference code are, of course, simple operations like create, store, and serve this reference code. And then we have some more complex operations that are update. I say more complex because once uh, an item, so a reference code, enters in one of the register, it has to be there uh, forever, let's say. Uh, because uh, it could be pointed by some of the, some, some data, and so it should be there, uh, it should be always there. That's why we have these three, these four, um, mm, these four uh, <coughs> uh, operation, that is the clarification that it is going to provide new version of the same reference code. And then we have super supersession, invalidation, and retirement. That it's going to deal with uh, uh, reference code that are no more valid or that has to be retired. Uh, these uh, three operations are going, of course, to keep the identifier uh, but change the status of the item. Okay, but what about Inspire? Why do we need uh, registry, uh, registries in Inspire? And if, it, if you think about the first example, it's clear that we need it to allow an ambiguous reference to the different items. And uh, to do this, we need uh, un unique and persistent identifiers for each resources. And of course, uh, we need it also to uh, allow consistent management and versioning of the items. Here I listed some of, no, the whole of the register that are contained currently in the Inspire registry. But you can see, you, you, you can go and you can browse it on the Inspire registry service website. Okay, 
let's talk about uh, the registry software that is an open source solution for managing and sharing the reference codes. It has been developed under the ARENA Action 117 of the ISA program, and it will continue on the ELISE uh, Action 10 of the ISA Square program. Here I show you some of the features of the registry software using the interface of the registry service. So we have multilingual interface, the capability of searching the, through the content of the registry. We have the versioning uh, capability for each of the item. And then here it is, uh, there is a, uh, an interesting uh, uh, characteristic that is the in addition to the common data that you can store, like label, definition, description, the registry software is, uh, was thinking from the beginning to be a really reusable tool. So we added this custom data that we also call custom attribute um, that basically can, uh, can add to the, to the model what, um, whatever field you want, like in this, in this slide, you can see the governance level that is not a standard, uh, a standard uh, field. So you can add what, uh, um, all of the field that you want. Then we have the status of the element and uh, you can also create uh, a hierarchy, a parent-child hierarchy between the items. And of the, the items of the same, uh, of the same uh, item class, let's say, uh, of the same type. <coughs> and then we can also link items between different uh, uh, classes. For example, here is the code list and it's linked with the team and the application schema. You can see there. Okay, there we have the, the feature that we provide multiple formats. These are the formats that are included with the, the registry software, the current version of the registry software. But uh, it's uh, really flexible because uh, you can add whatever format you want just uh, with a configuration in the, in the software. And then we have the possibility to provide hierarchical register like in this, uh, in this example because this is the code list with the associated code list values. Okay, let's go, uh, let's talk about uh, a bit more about the registry software. At the beginning, uh, uh, when we were thinking about uh, uh, creating a tool to manage reference code, we started thinking about uh, uh, how, at the moment, the reference code were stored. And mostly, we stored it in a spreadsheet file, so a simple spreadsheet file. So we decided to, trans decided to translate it in a CSV uh, file because it was more simple to, to be processed by our, uh, by, by a software tool. So the registry software is taking this CSV format and is processing it. There is a consistency check that is checking all of the item to avoid uh, broken links and to avoid the duplication of elements. And then after the check, uh, all the elements are stored in a uh, a database with the structure specified in the, in the import file. Okay, then the, the next step is uh, that the registry software is storing all of, all of the reference code as a static file in the file system with a different formats. This file could be then used to provide a web service, like for example, the Inspire registry service, that could be accessed both by human or uh, machine, uh, machine uh, users. Mm, okay, the current uh, version is the 1.2, but we are already testing the 1.3 version that contains uh, these two main, imp main improvements that are the ability to reference to externally defined values. So, you can specify in your import file items that are not belonging from, the, from, from your registry, basically, but from external, uh, externally defined items, so external registries. And uh, the other important improvement is the, um, the ability to basically produce 
the, uh, the file that then allow you to automatically um, put your registry in the federation, the register federation. Um, the, register, the register federation is, um, is basically a federation of register of the um, Inspire community, let's say. Uh, we are planning already the, the, ver the next version, the next big version of the, the, the registry software with some improvements that are, for example, the editing user interface. And the aim is basically to, uh, to really go in each of the, uh, to, to give you the ability of go in uh, uh, each of the reference code and editing it without the use of the import file. That could be difficult and not so user friendly in, uh, in some way. Then, okay, we have the guided software installation because we know that currently the installation of the registry is uh, it's not so simple. We are planning also to add the, the API for direct call to the registry software. And maybe we are also planning to provide the software as a service, so as a kind of central, uh, uh, central service. And then we are also open to other suggestions, uh, of course. Okay, then we have some presentation and they at the Inspire stand. Uh, you can see it there, but there is also there are also some leaflets around with these uh, dates. And uh, I would like also to invite you to complete uh, our uh, feed our survey uh, because basically we need the feedback uh, for. Uh, for the new version of the registry, the, big, the, the, the main release, the new uh, version of the, the registry. We need uh, some input from you, what you need, uh, and even also some feedback from, for, for this version. Thank you. Thank you, Daniele. Are there any questions about the registry? Clear. Again, great opportunities for you to talk to the developers at the booth. So, please. I forgot to say that currently we are uh, we are also uh, working on a document that is uh, uh, that is called uh, uh, guidelines and uh, best practice for registries and registers that should you, should help you in uh, developing and going through this uh, reference code and reference code management systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, Daniel. Okay, so we're roughly on time. Uh, we have uh, one last main presentation, but then I will borrow some of your time at the end to say a couple of messages. So this time, allegedly, it's over to me, uh, but I really haven't been doing this work, so I'll invite some of our contractors up here to say more about what we're doing. So as was mentioned earlier, there was quite a lot of work done in the Geo portal to do with validation and testing of metadata. Uh, but under ARENA, we're quite interested in the topic as well because the eyes of programs interested in testing interoperability. And we took the opportunity to see how we could make a reference validator, not only for metadata, for other components of Inspire. So um, we have our contractors, uh, PwC and Interactive Instruments that have been supporting this work and this is work, it's the, the last key piece of the ARENA project that will be running uh, until the summer next year. Uh, importantly, it has involved the inputs from uh, and interaction with uh, colleagues in MIWP5 looking into the topic of validation and testing in INSPIRE. Um, and in specifically within this context, uh, the conformance testing uh, involves uh, the metadata, as I mentioned, but also the network services and data sets. Um, where a lot of the early work in the project since last year was really focusing on the development of the abstract test suites and reaching a common agreement about them. Uh, so where are we within this context? There are lots of different validators that have been out there. Um, very interesting developments that we've heard in previous conferences from different member states, plus, as I mentioned, the, the validator on the Geo portal for metadata. Um, but what we were trying to do here is look at a way that we could develop a reusable open source reference validator. So how can we reach some common agreement on a technical level for some aspects of validation? 
Um, we want to not start from scratch. There have been previous examples and solutions out there for different aspects of testing and validation, and we want to build upon those. But also we want to offer you uh, essentially configurable software and test rules uh, so that organizations can test conformance also through the process. It's not testing at the end. Maybe you need to do this several times as you go through the activities. So hopefully you can see the link between uh, Robert's presentation where you're finding your scope and picking out the objects, but then you go through the transformation process and you want to make sure if it's correct. So in some sense, all of this fits together. But uh, as part of what we're doing here, we're trying to create a reusable testing infrastructure in Inspire, and the lessons that we learn from this will feed back into the ISA program. Because essentially, I think a lot of what we do in Inspire is quite advanced in terms of data interoperability, and the way that these things work could provide a lot of information for other commission-led activities. So I'll stop here and hand over to Jon from Interactive Instruments, because they've really been doing the work. And certainly the, the technical explanation is much better coming from them. So, Jon, over to you. So, thank you, Robin, and good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to talk about the basis of the implementation of the Inspire Validator. And um, the technical guidances specify uh, testable implementation options for the implementing rules. So there are stated requirements in the technical guidances which are grouped into conformance classes. And from these requirements, uh, test cases are derived which cover one or multiple requirements. Um, test cases um, covering all requirements um, are ordered into abstract test suites and agreed by the MIGT subgroup. So from these abstract test suites, executable tests, uh, test suites can be implemented on a sufficiently uh, detailed level to interact with the test object. And a test object might be um, a web service, um, a metadata record, or a data set. Um, inside the executable test suites, there are assertions that are grouped into test cases. And these assertions um, are written in a test language and um, are atomic tests. So there will be two deployment options for the Inspire validator. First, um, there is a central deployment, there will be a central deployment where the Inspire validator will be hosted by JRC so that a user or a software can control the Inspire validator um, and the Inspire validator accesses the service or uh, the user or the software have to um, upload uh, the data set to the central deployment. And the central deployment will use uh, the commonly agreed executable test suite that are based on the abstract test suites. But there will be a second deployment option where organizations can uh, install the Inspire validator locally so that um, data sets stay within the organization and um, the services can also test it locally. Furthermore, it's possible that um, executable uh, test suites, for instance, for national profiles, can be added to the existing um, executable test suites. The whole implementation is based on a, um, or documented in a design report, which is publicly available, and. Um, Reused, we reused an um, existing tool called the ETF test framework, uh, which is extended by um, additional capabilities. And this test framework supports um, test engines for validating web services and very large XML documents. We are talking about hundreds of gigabytes that can be tested. And we also reused existing executable test suites. Um, so, 
currently there are a couple of draft test suites um, available which were developed, um, including metadata tests. Um, there is a data specification template tests, um, which is independent of the data set, uh, on the data specification. And we also implemented um, two tests for um, the hydrography and the protected sites theme. Um, other Annex 1 um, data specification tests um, are currently under development and in the next iteration of the software we will also include download service tests. Um, the whole ETS uh, executable test suite uh, development um, is publicly available and hosted on GitHub. Um, there's also a uh, developer um, documentation um, that is uh, accessible through the wiki page of the GitHub. Um, as I already said, we um, are reusing existing executable test suites, including uh, WMS, WFS, uh, predefined and direct access, and Atom Inspire uh, download services that were developed, mainly developed by GeoNovo. And these tests need some updates um, because of the structure of the abstract test suites. And we need also to improve um, a little bit the usability in sense of the understandability of issues that are reported. And it's also planned that we integrate the OGC team engines and the uh, OGC side tests for basic tests of uh, services. Docker is a new technology um, which enables a an user to, or an organization to make um, quick and easy deployments. And we also developed a um, Docker image for the test framework. And um, this can be very easily deployed and um, only the executable test suites have to be added to the deployment and then it's ready to run. These steps have to be documented soon by us. Okay. Um, if you want to see the Inspire Validator in action, there will be um, two demos at the Inspire booth, one at 12.30 today, and another demo session tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. And if you have questions, just uh, talk to us. Um, Clemens, um, Michael, Robin, and I do not see Jens. Ah, okay. And um, yeah, if you're interested in testing the Inspire test framework, um, please write an email to Arena. I, do you want to say something about you? No? Okay. Uh, just write an email and you get access to the alpha version of the Inspire Validator. That's it. Thank you very much. So just to uh, reiterate one thing that Jon said at the end there, we are looking for a select group of people to join us with the alpha testing. So again, if you're interested, uh, please email us. Are there any questions on this topic as well? Stunned into silence. Well, maybe you can. There's one mic here, please. Nothing. I forget it. Too too long. <laughs> Sorry. Really? Because you were you were worrying there. You were worrying me there for a minute. <laughs> we we talk we talk later. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Almost there. I, I just uh, want to share with you one more, or rather two slides, uh, just to finish. So.
Um, the session was really designed to give you the opportunity to hear a lot of what's been going on in the JRC for the last year in trying to create these tools, some of which of course are reusable uh, for deployment in your organizations and trying to put in place, uh, well, what we think are some of the central components to make Inspire work. But I just want to share with you information about two competitions. So if you are working in a public administration, uh, the ISA program, or now ISA squared, has organized this uh, competition to really explore this notion of reusable tools and reusability. So they have an action called sharing and reuse. And if you are working in a public administration, or I guess potentially supporting one, but through a public administration, creating open source software and solutions or sharing services, uh, you can win a prize of up to 15,000 euros uh, to demonstrate how your activity is supporting uh, the sharing of, of software or services across borders, but also at national, regional, or local levels. And you can access uh, the information through this site. And I see some people with phones, so I'll pause for a second so you can uh, win those uh, 15,000. And I, I would say it'd be very nice if somebody from the geospatial domain wants to win one of those prizes, because then we can help promote our activity even further within European e-government. And the last opportunity, because I do enjoy self-promotion, uh, we are uh, running a little game during the conference. Uh, we took the opportunity to tell you about some of our tools. We really want to know about some of your activities. Uh, it's really split into three categories. What are you doing currently? What have you heard about at the conference that's interesting in, in terms of software that supports the implementation of Inspire? And of course, we're also going around all the booths ourselves to talk to the solution providers. Uh, what are you doing? Uh, in terms of end user applications. Many people are asking, what are people using Inspire for? We hear about examples. We take the opportunity to say to you today, tell us about it. So register a small amount of information in our platform. You have to register with ACAS first if you've not already. And then lastly, the bit that's a little bit more complicated, but we've here really beneficial for implementers. We've created a set of tasks uh, that we think in generic terms explain what you have to do to implement Inspire. Pick one of those tasks, explain to us in a couple of sentences how you're performing it, and link to the software tool that you're using. And this is a whole process that we can then help share with each other who's using which software, how to approach certain topics, and kind of fill the gap between the technical guidelines and how people are putting, as we call it now, Inspire in practice. We'll pick some winners. There are some prizes uh, this time, because I've done something similar in the past. There's trophies which will have an obvious form that you'll hear about on Friday. Uh, and basically, we'll try and pick some winners in terms of the nicest implementation example, the most used tool, and the most interesting app. So we'll make some decisions on that on Friday morning. But basically, uh, the game starts now. Uh, and please join the game. It's also an opportunity, of course, for you to use the platform and provide us with feedback. So thanks, everybody, for the session. It's now time for coffee. <laughs>